Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. I'm Bill Benson, and I have hosted First Person since it began at the museum in 2000. Each month, we share firsthand accounts of survival during the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. Holocaust survivors are Jews who experienced the persecution and survived the mass murder that was carried out by the Nazis and their collaborators. This included those who were in concentration camps, killing centers, ghettos, and prisons, as well as refugees or those in hiding. Holocaust survivors also include people who did not self-identify as Jewish, but were categorized as such by the perpetrators. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Josie Traum share her firsthand account of the Holocaust with us. Josie, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person. My pleasure to be here, Bill. Thank you. Josie, you have so much to share with you. We're going to go ahead and get started. You were born in March 1939 in Brussels, Belgium, to your parents, Jacques and Fanny Eisenberg. Tell us about your parents and your family's life in Belgium. Um, my parents uh, were both born in Poland. So we went to Belgium as children with their families. My mom moved. Both my mom and dad were both, both born in Poland. My mom was born in Lodz. She came to Belgium with her parents when she was about seven, eight years old. My father was born in Radom, Poland, and came to Belgium with his parents when he was a teenager, probably around 14 or 15. So they both grew up in Belgium. and. Um, met eventually when they were older, a little bit of teenagers who were married in 1938. Um, my father was um, a violinist and a tailor, and my mother was a dress designer and um, designed clothes, patterns, and uh, actually was very creative in designing. Your, um, your parents uh, married in 1938, so the photo we just saw, of course, was their wedding photo. Josie, tell us how, why you were given your name, Josiane. <laughs> yeah, um, I always wondered myself. Um, Josiane was the name of a very popular cabaret singer in Belgium. She sang, her name was Josiane, and she sang in different clubs. My mother liked her singing, so she named me Josiane. I've never heard, I've never met anyone else by that name. And, and your mother, as you said, she was both a seamstress and a dress designer. Yes. Um, but more than that, she was also selected to work for the royal family of Belgium. Yes. Tell us about that. Yes, absolutely. Um, she went to a vocational school, I suppose after high school, where people go and learn a trade. And my mother went to a school where she learned designing, pattern making, sewing. And when you graduate from that school, the royal family would send an emissary to choose one or two outstanding students to work for the royal household. My mother, at the graduation, she was chosen, and she actually started working for the royal family, which was a really, really big deal. Mm -hmm. My mother was so proud of that. She actually designed the, the clothes for the royal family for special events when they would do anything or anything special. So it was quite an honor to be chosen to be working for them. And I think in this next picture, we see your mother's work on a real princess. Yes, she was so creative. She made all my clothes and that particular little dress. As you could see, she makes pockets, uh, making them like two flower pots with two flowers coming out. 
All her clothes were so creative. She made them out of scarves, out of materials that she found. And they were lovely and very different. And you mentioned a moment ago as well that your father was both a violinist and a tailor. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, of course. My father <clears throat> played the violin and in the early 30s, the movies that people went to for entertainment uh, were not, uh, they were not talkies. People were not talking in them. They were silent. And as a result, different movie houses would hire musicians. Each movie house had a quartet, usually a violin, a viola, a cello, maybe a bass. And, the quartet would play some classical music in accompaniment to the actors talk, not speaking, but acting. So they had music playing, no speaking, but music. When the talkies came, um, they no longer needed these musicians and all these musicians lost their jobs. My dad would then went to a school to learn tailoring. And so he was a tailor and a violinist. You know, it's amazing to think of just at one fell swoop, once once uh, the silent picture era ended, all those musicians had to find new occupations. Right. Yeah. And, right, and they did, yeah. Josie, World War II began in September, 1939. And eight months later in May, 1940, Nazi Germany invaded Belgium, the Netherlands, and France. Your parents both became involved in the resistance movement in Belgium. Your mother, Fanny, who lived until the age of 101 and passed away in 2018, was also a part of our first person program. We have a clip from her program in 2012 where she describes their involvement with the resistance. Let's listen to what Fanny said in 2012. From the end of 39 and beginning of 1940, as soon Belgium was occupied, my late husband and I, we were involved with the young people who came to Belgium in hiding or illegally. And that's how it started to be the underground. We call it solidarity, whatever you want to call it. But thanks to those people, so many things have been able to happen and to help. And we too, at that time where we lived, we had an addict. And the only thing I had to do is to give each one, there were six people who were hiding in that attic and they each had a key. They had pamphlets printed there, ammunition exchange, or whatever they had to do. Josie, in that clip, your mother comes across as nonchalant about the work she was doing, but she was risking her life. Will you reflect for us on the dangers your parents faced by working with the resistance? Absolutely. You know, the Germans were walking. They were in Belgium. They were walking up and down the streets and whatever they wanted at whatever their whim was, they would stop people on the street and ask for identification cards. The identification card actually marked whether they were Jews or not. And in Belgium, it was written in French saying, Juif. And so that if people were caught doing anything that the Germans didn't think was acceptable, they could arrest you, they could shoot you. So whatever my mom was doing, if she was caught, it would have been extremely dangerous. We, I don't know what would have happened to her, but she did these things. Not only did she hide Jews, but she would deliver messages. She was a courier and she would deliver different messages about different events or meetings or things that were happening. In, in addition to your father doing work with resistance in the very beginning, he then made another important decision 
about what to do next. Tell us what your father decided he was going to do. Well, my parents were listening to the radio, to the BBC actually, and England was actually asking people to come, men to come and volunteer to come to England and help um, with the war effort. My dad, it was rumored in Belgium at that time by the Jewish community, in the Jewish community, that when the Germans would invade and come into Belgium, they would only arrest the men and leave the women and children alone. And I think that's how they, my parents made the decision that my dad should volunteer and go to England. And so he and his brother, Ben, my uncle, both tailors, um, actually took one of the last ships to cross the English Channel before the war started. They crossed, as I said, one of the last ships. After that, ships were not able to cross anymore because the Germans were torpedoing a lot of the ships crossing the channel. My dad and his brother got to England. In England, they evaluated these two men who were tailors. What are they going to do with them? And they placed them both in a factory in London making British uniforms. So that was actually their contribution to the war effort. And my dad was actually placed in a unit. It was the, um, the Polish contingent of the British Army. Mm -hmm. And he actually, he and his brother were there for the entire duration of the war. And, and as you said, when your father and his brother made that decision to, to leave and join the British Army, they were all operating on the assumption that the Nazis weren't going to hurt women and children. So it was okay to leave you and your, your mother behind and go to Germ and go to Britain. And, and also um, I, I noted uh, they left from Dunkirk, which of course we yes. know so many soldiers did not make it in many ships. So it was, I think one of the, you, you said one of the last ships to get out of Dunkirk uh, when they fled. Now yeah. at the time, did your mother know any of that? Did they know that he got to England? Did they know did your mom know that he, uh, what he did once he got to England, or did that was that learned much later? No, actually not. There was not the same kind of communication as there is today. There were no cell phones, no other ways of communicating. My mother didn't know whether my dad ever got to London, got to England. Really, she had no idea what what had happened to him. So with you and your mother remaining in Brussels, um, living under Nazi occupation, no idea what happened to your father. Tell us what you can about what that time was like for you and your mother. We, well, my mother and I lived on our own. We actually often went to my mother's parents, uh, my, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents who lived nearby we would often go to them to eat and to be with them. But my mother was very much on her own, um, having to take care of me and relying on whatever services were available. Although the services were not the same as before, there used to be what they call a crèche, which is like um, a place where you go for medical and nursing and supportive care with a newborn child. And there you would get your injections, your shots, some formulas, whatever was needed. That closed. Jews were no longer allowed to go there. So my mother was very much on her own. How she managed, I don't know. Food was rationed. And whatever she had was whatever she received. Tell, tell us a little bit more about your maternal grandparents because they were very important in your life at that time and before that. Yes, absolutely. Um, my parents, my grandparents were very active in the Jewish community, in the synagogue. My grandfather was what they call a gabai, 
where he actually organizes and schedules all the events, the prayers, everything that goes on in the synagogue. My grandmother was actually part of uh, a special group of people who take care of the dead. There's a, there are rituals that are followed when a Jewish person dies. Their body is cleaned, cleansed, dressed, and watched over, guarded until the burial. And it's really an honor and a special deed to do this because you can't be repaid or or paid by the person because they die. Right. And that's really it. So it's really a very special gift that you give to people. And my grandmother did that. She actually took care of the dead. And Josie, tell us just a bit about this photograph. Oh, this is on my grandmother's balcony where she lived. Um, worse, I... I felt very close to my grandmother. I can, I can see I'm hugging her and holding her. She was very warm, and very, um, very loving. It, it looks like you are absolutely holding her very tightly in that, in that photograph. Yes, I did. I, oh. I, I did. It, although you were very young at that time, about two years old, you do have a few fleeting memories, including one of riding on a bus with your mother. Will you tell us about your memory of that? Yes. Um, there was not very much we could do, um, my mom and I, to do for entertainment or leisure. And my mom would take me sometimes on a bus, on a bus ride, um, not a bus like here, but an electric trolley where it's hooked up to cables. And so my mom and I, my mom took me on one of these trolleys for a ride. We got up on the bus and we went all the way to the back seats, the last row, as a matter of fact, while we were riding on the bus, uh, which I think I seem to enjoy. Um, this Nazi, it, full gear, full uniform, uniform came and boarded the bus and he started going from row to row different seat, seats asking for people's identification cards my mother and i were sitting in the back seat as i mentioned the last row and my mother was really shaking i didn't understand why but you could see she was visibly um, upset. I didn't understand why. This Nazi went from row to row asking for people's identification card. And we came just before the last row where my mom and I were sitting. He turned around and got off the bus. I don't know why. I don't know if someone was looking over, watching over on us. But we weren't, um, we weren't touched or asked to give our identification card. My mom stopped shaking. And I think I understood what was happening. Not quite, but somehow. It, 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 somehow you just, it sounds like you just, you could sense the yeah. tension yeah. and the danger and, and just knew it was a very scary moment for your mom. Right. But, I, but I didn't know why. Right. Um, you know, I was two, two and a half years old. Right. I didn't understand very much at the time. Mm -hmm. Josie, following two years of Nazi occupation, the Nazis began rounding up and deporting Jews from Belgium in August of 1942. This prompted your mother to make a truly profound decision. What did she do to try to protect you under those circumstances? She actually, there's my mom and I, this is just before I was placed in hiding. By the way, the dress I'm wearing, of course, my mom made it beautiful um, with little pleats. I remember she's called that Lina Bay. 
those are little pleats. Um, she made beautiful clothes and she actually looks lovely and beautiful. Um, my mother made the decision to go because she was involved in the underground and in the resistance. She actually went to them and said, please, can you hide my child? And uh, they did. One day, two strange ladies came to pick me up. My mother was not allowed to know where they were taking me or placing me. They figured, the underground figured that um, when the Nazis came to arrest you, they would say, where's the rest of your family? And if you didn't know, no matter how much they tortured you, they couldn't get it out of you because you really didn't know. So I think that must have been the most difficult thing that my mom did to make that decision to just give me away, not knowing where I was going, hoping that I would be safe. And uh, I know she told me I was very, I was crying and screaming. I didn't want to leave her. And I didn't understand what was going on. Josie, we, we do have another clip um, of your mother at a first person program in 2012, in which she reflected on what you've just described. Let's, let's go ahead and listen as she describes this truly difficult moment. After sleepless night and being tormented, not knowing what to do. At that time, my child was three years old. I couldn't decide what to do to put in hiding. I was just a single mother. I was the only one to make any decision. And I cannot tell you how heartbreaking this was. When two ladies came, which was prearranged, and they took my child into hiding, she was screaming and crying because she didn't want to leave. And finally, when they left, I completely collapsed because we were not allowed to know where those children would be in hiding because in case we would be caught and beaten, we would divulge where they are in hiding. So we were not allowed to know and we never knew who was going to take care of my precious child. Josie, do you recall your mother later talking to you and describing what it was like for her to do what she just described and, and you described before that. Do you, she say more to you about that later? You know, she was so brave. I don't know how she did that. Having children and grandchildren of my own, I'm not sure I could make that decision um, because of her and her decision. I'm here and I'm alive today. Um, I'm amazed that she was able to do that. Mm -hmm. Josie, after your mother, because of her connections probably to the resistance, as you said, was able to arrange for the underground to, to, to take you into hiding. Yes. After you were taken by the two women from the resistance, you were placed at the Sisters of Spermali Convent in Bruges. What, what do you remember about your time in this convent? Well, these, it was a convent in Bruges, a beautiful little city full of canals, and full of convents. Um, these nuns were very much like the nuns dressed in the sound of music, very stiff, very strict. Um, they didn't sing, but they did say there were children. Um, I used to play in the courtyard uh, with the children. It was very much like an orphanage. Mm -hmm. um, food was rationed in Belgium, and there was so little food. So I think, you know, people would place their children, um, Christian children, into a convent thinking that somehow the nuns would be able to get some food so the courtyard was usually full of kids playing together, saying their rosaries. I used to say my rosaries in French and not knowing what I was saying. But um, I must say I'm really grateful these nuns 
save Jewish children. When I was there at that time, there were three Jewish, we were three Jewish children all together there. So the nuns actually saved us and fed us and made sure we were safe. I assume it was later that you learned that there were other Jewish children there in the uh, convent with you. I'm sorry. I, 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 I assume it was later that you learned that there were other Jewish children yes. in the convent with you. Yeah. It was later that I, I found out that they were hiding at that time, three of us, three Jewish children. Yeah. Uh, I know you've said that they were, they were strict, a strict order. Yes. Um, and, and you were a, by your own definition, a finicky eater. Uh, <laughs> how, how, what, what happened with that? Can you imagine during the war, hardly any food, and I was a fussy eater. Um, I was very fussy. I had to be bribed to get my food and to eat it. Um, I, was, I guess I must have been a real difficult kid. Hard to imagine that, actually, Josie. But anyway, and when you were placed into hiding, not only were you, as you said, saying the rosary, um, uh, in the convent, but you were also given a new name. What, what was the name that was given to you? Actually, my name, um, my family name was a very Jewish sounding. So I think through the underground, um, I had received new identification cards. They changed my name to a more German name instead of Eisenberg. I was, my last name was called Berg, and uh, I kept that name through the entire duration of the war. Do you, do you recall if, if you at some point actually believed that that was your last name because you were so young? Um, no. No. Uh, I do. I did see it because I received papers mm. from the Belgian government showing that I had, they had changed my name. Mm -hmm. Uh, from Eisenberg to Berg. My first name remained the same. Josiane is the French singer. Yeah. Josie, um, what, as you think back about that, what do you think, what do you believe to have been the most significant impact on you from that time that you were in that convent? Well, the impact, the fact that I really... I miss not being with my family, yeah. my grandparents and my mother. And I feel very fortunate that I had them for the first two years of my life and uh, was very close to them, had a very loving and warm relationship with them. And I think that kind of helped me get through. <laughs> Would, at some point while you were in the convent, the nuns did make a decision to move you out of the convent. What, what do you know about that? Um, what I've been told, um, <clears throat> apparently the Nazis uh, suspected that the nuns were hiding Jewish children. So one day, after I was there about between six months and maybe a little longer, the Nazis came to the convent and said, we're picking up the Jewish children. And the nuns said, you know, they're not ready yet. Why don't you come back another day? We'll have them all packed up for you and then you could just pick them up. And the Nazis left. And that night, the nuns smuggled the three Jewish children, including me, out of the convent. I came to Brussels and placed me with a Catholic family, a mother, a father, and a little girl my age. And uh, they took me in. They were Catholic. They kept me safe. They fed me. They shared the Russian food with me. And really, I'm grateful to them because I stayed with them for the duration of the war. And, and this Catholic family the, was the du Brocolaire family. Yes. And yes. it was 1943 when uh, either the nuns or the underground took you back to Brussels and you ended up in the 
in the home of the Du Brocolaires. Um, we have a photograph of the family. I'd like you to tell us tell us about this photograph. Um, standing in the back on the upper right is Mr. and Mrs. de Brachler. Mrs. de Brachler is on the right. Mr. de Brachler is on the left. Right below on the ground, on the right, standing in front of Mrs. de Brachler. And on the left of the de Brachler are my grandparents' and neighbors. They weren't Jews. They came, they were very close to my grandparents. And they came to visit me one day at the de Brachler's. Um, that's them right in the back. And by the way, on the left, lower left side, the three children, I'm on the right. And uh, the de Brachler's little girl is on the left. And the little boy in the middle is the neighbor's um, my grandparents' uh, neighbor's little boy. They came to visit me one day, which was nice. I usually didn't go out of the apartment. It was too dangerous. I couldn't be just walking and wandering on the street. So this was a real special outing, the fact that they came to visit me. And yet you were, and you were able to go outside uh, as a result of that. That's fine, yes, I, I d usually did not. Do you do you remember anything about the Du Brocolaire's daughter, the other little girl that was in the home with you? Well, she was my age, and we played together all day. Really, I didn't go out. We weren't in school. We played with toys, little dolls, whatever we had. Josie, tell us if anything more that you know about the Du Brocolaire family, because um, you spent as you know a couple of years with them. What uh, what, what was that time like for you? Um, well, I, they, you know, obviously they kept me safe mm -hmm. and uh, they fed me. Mister Du Brocolaire was involved with the resistance, and in fact. Um, very often, the Nazis came and would take him out for interrogation. They would interrogate him, and in the evening, they would take him out, and in the morning, next morning, he would come back to the apartment, bruised. They would often beat him, interrogate him. He never told on me or whatever he was doing, I have no idea what this man went through. The de Brocolaires were a loving family. Um, they saved me. They helped me. But um, I wasn't totally part of the family unit. And and you 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 experienced that from what you've told me. In that you were, you were there. They were taking care of you. They were saving you. But you weren't part of the family, so you didn't have that the depth of affection and bond that that is so important. Right. But it's not that they didn't care for me. They did. But um, there was a, a difference not being part of the unit. Yeah. Say a little bit about what you th what the risk was for both the nuns in the convent as well as the Du Brocolaire to, to hide a Jewish child. What, what was the risk to them? Probably death. Um, I know the nuns, when they told the Nazis to come back to pick up the Jewish children, and they smuggled us out. I don't know what happened when the Nazis came back looking for us. I don't want to think about it even. Yeah. But they were taking such risk. I mean, they really risked their lives. The de Brocolaires also, if they had been found by the Nazis, they could have been deported or shot. Yeah. I don't know what could have happened. Mm -hmm. They were taking great risks. Mm -hmm. Josie, we have um, a video uh, question for you from a student uh, from Ava Jane in Washington, D.C. Let's go here. Go ahead and and hear Eva Jane's question of you and then um, your thoughts in response to her. 
Hi, my name is Amy Jane and I'm from Washington, D.C. And my question is, so was it difficult for you to adjust to the various places you were put in um, during the war, including the convent and the Catholic family? Ava Jane wow. asks you, Josie, was it difficult to adjust to the various places you were put in during the war, including the convent and with the Catholic family? Um, <clears throat> You know, looking back now, I was two, three, four years old. I think the, the main thing is I didn't understand what was going on. I was just being moved around, not knowing why or not knowing what was going on. All I knew is I was I separated from my mother and my grandparents. Um, you know, at that age, I didn't even know what a Jew was. Right. I really did not understand what was happening. I was being moved around and uh, somehow kept safe. And, and while you were being kept safe in hiding, your grandfather was denounced and then deported. And then after some time, your mother and your grandmother were also denounced, this time by a neighbor. To tell us what you can about what happened to them when they were denounced? Yeah. Um, my grandfather <clears throat> was arrested and deported first. Um, in Belgium, the Nazis had what they call a holding camp where they would collect prisoners and when they would have a mass, a certain number, to, enough to deport them, and to send them as prisoners by train to con concentration camps, to labor camps, concentration camps. My grandfather was deported first and placed in one of these holding camps. In Belgium, the holding camp was called Maline in French, or in Flemish, she was called Menneken. My grandfather was there for a number of weeks then was deported to Auschwitz. I had heard rumors that my grandfather died on the train, on the cattle car, on his way to Auschwitz. Um, my mother and grandmother were arrested soon after and deported and um, taken by cattle car to Auschwitz. Um, when you de de when you got off the cattle car, there was a selection um, where if people, prisoners were young enough or able to work, they would be placed on, it was a selection, they were placed in one line because they felt they could still work. And Auschwitz had a labor camp right next to them called Birkenau, where they actually made ammunition. Mm -hmm. They filled bombs and grenades with chemicals. Um, one line was for people who were young enough and able to work. The other line was for older folks or handicapped people, like my grandmother, who was too old, considered too old to work. She must have been 50 years old. So my mother and grandmother and her mother were separated immediately, were in two different lines. My mother, because she was young enough, in one line where she could work, and my grandmother in another line. My mother immediately, when they were separated, went to be and stand with her mother. The German came over to her and swiped her really hard and told her, you go where you're told, and don't move. And she actually never saw her mother again. My mother was in Auschwitz for about two years. She survived starvation, labor camp, medical experiments, and um, was eventually liberated. And, uh, no, no. And I'll ask you a bit more about that in a little bit, if that if that's okay. You remained with the Dubrocolaires until Brussels was liberated in September 1944. Your mother's sister, Therese, came to collect you from their home. 
how was her how was Therese able to find you? Do you know? Well, um, you know, in Belgium there was a whole network of people being able to find each other. People had names of people being hidden, and they found each other. My mother had two sisters, my two aunts, Therese and Rose. They were hidden in churches during the war. When Belgium was liberated, they immediately, my aunt Therese started looking for me and found me. They found me at the Debarcalers and immediately took me to their home. And we're, it was wonderful being with family again. Mm -hmm. So I felt, you know, the warmth, the hugs, it was wonderful. And so I stayed with my aunt till, um, till the end of the war. And, and and your aunt Therese, who who came and found you, uh, her husband, your uncle Morris. Tell us about Uncle Morris. Yes, Uncle Morris became very famous um, after the war. He was apparently my uncle Morris was part of the underground. He got a special award for killing the most Germans in hand to hand combat. It was hard for any of us to believe this. Uncle Morris was a loving, sweet, gentle man who didn't lift a finger to hurt anyone. And yet he got this special award from the government. We were all shocked. Mm -hmm. um, well, his wife and his, the whole family. So it was quite admirable. Mm -hmm. And Josie, speaking of awards, uh, please tell us about this next photograph. Uh, yes. Um, the Belgium government gave awards to people um, or commemorations and recognition to people who were part of the underground and helping the Belgium government against the Nazis. And my mom was part of the underground as was this little boy standing there. That's me on the right with a circle and this little boy on the left. Both our parents were part of the underground and helping the Belgium government against the Germans. And we got a special award. As you can see, we're wearing these ribbon sashes. And my mother was still, hadn't come back yet. She hadn't been liberated. And, uh, but we received the awards in, in their honor and their name. That, that, that's a, that's a, a remarkable photo. And, and I'm struck, Josie, by how erect you and the other little boy are. It's clear from that image, it seems to me, you knew the gravity and seriousness of that moment. I think so. I understood something was happening. And something had happened. Yeah. Your as you as you explained to us, Josie, your mother Fanny did survive Auschwitz and Birkenau, and returned to Brussels after her liberation in April 1945. You know, really about eight months or so after you were liberated. After seven months of living with your aunt Teresa, you were reunited with your mother. You were just six years old and hadn't seen her for three years, really half your life. Tell us what you remember or know of what the reunion was like for you with, with your mother. My mother tells me that I remembered her. And I remember seeing her and um, being together with her, um, you know, going through the emotions now, it's so fresh, but I do remember seeing her. I do remember being afraid to lose her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, I remember your mother telling me that 
you tied your uh, uh, night shirt, your nightgown, she yeah. you tied them together. Uh, that's something you did. Yes. Yeah. I was really, I was so afraid to lose her again. Yeah. Um, I did. I tied my nightgown with a knot to hers so that I would not lose her again. When, when, when your mother came back, had anybody had advance notice that she was coming? Did your aunts know that she was coming back? No. No, just, just son. She just did, appeared. Just appeared. My, yeah. She went to her sister's house, knocked on the door, and there I was. Yeah. Nobody knew she would be coming. The Red Cross brought her back to Brussels. After being liberated and being in the hospital, she was quite sick. What, what so, kind of shape was she in then? She, as you said, she was very sick. She had typhus and meningitis. And um, she was in the hospital. And the Red Cross eventually, as I mentioned, brought her back to Brussels. And, and, and Josie, I think you, you know, referenced it a little while ago. You said that... Um, you know, she she not only w was worked almost to death, she uh, starvation, almost no food rationings, and she was even medically experimented on. Yeah, Dr. Mangala um, did medical experiments on her, and she really didn't know what was done to her. All she knows is that she was tied to a bed, and they did things to her. Josie, the next year, 1946, is when your father, Jacques, returned from England. Do you remember him coming back? And, and tell, us, tell us how that happened. Well, my father didn't come back to Belgium immediately. Um, during the war, there was a lot of bombing in London. And the house he was living in was bombed. He was injured and he spent two years in a hospital. He, he was quite cut up and injured. And so eventually he came back and we, the three of us were reunited, which I think was a very difficult time for the three of us. You know, the three of us had experienced totally different things. And I think we all needed support and healing mm -hmm. so it must have been difficult for my father who wasn't used to having a child he left when i was 13 months old mm -hmm. he came back here i am on the street walking with my mom and dad um, yeah. i i think you shared with me one time that you you remembered waiting at the bottom of the gangplank of the ship when he yeah. actually came back you you were at the gangplank oh, of the ship, yeah, when he came back. Yes. I remember standing there with my mother where the ship uh, landed in Ostend in Belgium. And my mother saying to me, there's your father. I had no idea who he was. Of course, I didn't recognize him. But it was like meeting a stranger. Josie, um, you've said in the past, um, I was just a little kid who needed to be held. Will you say a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, I feel very strongly that there's a process that happens in a child's development where they bombed with a person, a caretaker, doesn't have to be a parent, a caretaker, someone who is there for them um, at all times, whatever they do. And having a strong bond like that, I think it really makes a difference in a child's development and adjustment, readjustment later on in life. I really believe I had that with my mother, with my grandmother, I had this very special bonding that I think served me for my whole childhood. 
luckily. And, yeah. And indeed throughout your life. And uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. So given all that your parents and you, but all that your parents have been through, they're back together. How did they set out to rebuild their lives? Well, the first thing they did, they decided that they have to leave Europe. And they made that decision, started making applications. And um, it took four years. And in 1949, I immigrated with my parents to New Jersey, where my mother had an elderly aunt. And, you know, one usually goes where you have a relative. Mm -hmm. So we moved to Patterson, New Jersey, where my mom's aunt lived. And we lived with her for a month till my parents found work in an apartment. And um, we were very lucky. We were, first of all, we were reunited as a family. Mm -hmm. And uh, not many parents, not many families have that. We have a we have a uh, just a I think a lovely photo uh, our last photo. Tell us about this photo. Oh, that's my mom and I on the ship that on the way to the United States. It's a Polish ship called the Batory, and uh, that's our voyage to New York. Actually, we came at the same time. My father's brother, my uncle Ben who went to England with my father. He, his wife, and two little girls my age, uh, we all came to the United States at the same time on the same ship. Mm -hmm. So you are in the United States now, 1949. You're 10 years old. What was your adjustment like? You're in a brand new country across a big ocean. What was that like for you? Well, coming to this country, I did not speak one word of English. And um, because of that, I was 10 years old. They put me in first grade. I was never very tall, so I didn't stand out. Uh, as a 10-year-old in first grade, I learned a few English words. They then put me in second grade, then third grade, and eventually I caught up with my class. And as a matter of fact, I don't remember not speaking English ever now. But my parents, it was hard. They went to night school, learned English, wanted to become American citizens, learned all the capitals and all the states and all the presidents. So we readjusted. Mm -hmm. Josie, I just have one more question for you today, and that is, as we face rising anti-Semitism, related conspiracy theories, and Holocaust denial, please tell us what we can learn from what you experienced during the Holocaust. Um, I often speak to schools, to students, and when I speak to them and tell them of my experience, First of all, I tell them the experience so that they learn and know and understand what happened. And, but I also try to emphasize to them how important it is to interfere, to do something. Every person can actually do something, however small. They could really do something because they see someone being hurt by another person, they can actually go to them and say, it's not appropriate, it's not acceptable. You don't, you shouldn't do that. People need to be able to speak and say something, even when they start seeing the beginning of people being bad to each other yeah. or doing terrible things. You can make a difference, you can interfere, you can say something. I usually read a quote by a Lutheran minister, Martin Neimuller, who speaks about speaking out for people and doing something. Um, I have the quote here, actually, and would like to read it. Oh, I'd love to have you do that. 
first they came for the socialists. I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I did not speak out because I wasn't a Jew. And they came for me. And there was no one to speak for me. And this is Pastor Martin Ibuler, who at the beginning of the war was very pro-Nazi. When he saw what the Nazis were doing, he changed very much and was very much against them. And in fact, he was imprisoned by the Nazis. So this quote, every person can make a difference. However small, it is significant. I'm here because of that. People spoke out. Josie, thank you so much for your, your closing words. Thank you for the entire program. Um, I want our audience to know that um, you went on to have a stellar career in child welfare, including serving in child protective services for many years, taking care of and protecting abused and neglected children. Um, it's little wonder that um, you ended up doing something like that in light of uh, your, your early years. I also want our audience to know that besides your mother being a Holocaust survivor who we had till she was 101, your husband, Freddie Traum, was also a Holocaust survivor and part of our first person program and that Freddie passed away in early 2020, but he too uh, was a Holocaust survivor and after the war you met and, um, and, uh, and, and uh, were together for many, 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 many years. Josie, thank you so much for being with us today and doing this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. I'd like to take just a moment to thank our donors. First person is made possible through the generous support of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation. I'd also like to invite you to join our next first person program next month. Thank you for watching today.